Hi, welcome to the Bio 81 Tutoring Center videos. Today we're going to be talking about community structure. Uh, so we're going to start off by talking about tropic uh, structure, and that is just the feeding relationships among communities, so which species in the community is eating who. Um, and we tend to see this uh, trend when we're looking at it. So we start with our primary producers, so those are going to be the organisms that are doing photosynthesis and producing the sugars and the energy. Um, and then those are going to be consumed by our primary consumers. And um, those tend to be our um, herbivores, so things that eat plants. And then our primary consumers are going to be uh, consumed by our secondary consumers, uh, which will then go to tertiary and quaternary. And so those tend to be things like carnivores that eat other animals. And so uh, if we look at this, uh, we like to call this uh, a food chain. It shows the relationship from our primary producers up to our quaternary and tertiary consumers. However, um, in real life and in nature, it's usually not just a straight up um, sort of thing like a chain. We more of see these food webs which show multiple interactions going on. And so I drew this kind of simple food web up here. And if you see, we've got uh, the grass that's getting eaten by the rabbits and the grasshoppers and the mouse. And then the mice are getting eaten by snakes and hawks. And the grasshoppers are getting eaten by lizards. And then lizards and rabbits and snakes are all getting eaten by hawks. And so we have more than just one interaction. And so this would be the whole food web. But if we're looking at individual food chain in this, we would start at uh, one of the primary producers and we would go up. Uh, and so if we're following this food chain, we go grass to mouse to snake to hawk, uh, looking at our primary producer, primary consumer, uh, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to note also that everything's not set in stone. So when, uh, when we're looking at this food chain and this food chain up, uh, the hawk is a tertiary consumer. However, if we look at this food chain, then the hawk is actually the secondary consumer. So it really just depends on uh, which way we're looking at this food web. Um, and food webs are actually a lot more complex than this just because there's so many interactions going on within a community. Um, and so one way that we simplify them actually is we kind of group similar species together. So there's lots of different species of grass and lots of different species of mice and snakes but by just kind of grouping them together in this general all snake species together. Uh, then we're able to simplify these food webs. Um, something interesting to know is that these food chains and webs usually don't exceed more than four or, or seven is actually the number, but they usually stay around four to five um, interactions within a food chain. So this one was just about four. And why is that? Why don't we have these really long uh, food chains? And there's kind of three reasons behind that. The first is the energetic hypothesis. And we're going to talk a little bit more of the details of this in another lecture video. But basically, the energetic hypothesis um, is supported by the idea that as we increase uh, each tropic level, only 10% of the energy or the biomass is transferred. So um, we can't uh, sustain all of this energy. So if we have 100 kilograms, um, of energy, uh, energy or biomass from the grass, only 10% of that, so 10 kilograms is transferred from the mouse, and then only another 10%, so one kilogram is transferred to the snake, and then only one kilogram, uh, 0.1 kilograms is transferred to the hawk. And so we're not able to support really long uh, chains because eventually we'll just uh, run out of this biomass that's needed to support them. Another idea is the dynamic stability hypothesis, and this is based on these bottom-up, top-down controls that we're going to talk about in a second. But it's the idea that shorter train, uh, chains are um, more stable. So if you have longer chains, they're more unstable. And so if we have unstable environments, which there could be things that uh, could affect the lower level of these uh, food chains, um, then we're going to want shorter chains. Because if we have a really long chain, uh, and something gets affected down here because of the environment, so we have some sort of fire that gets rid of a lot of our grass, uh, now the mouse aren't going to have as much food and they're going to decrease the number and the snakes aren't going to have as much food so they're going to decrease the number and the hawks. And so if we have a really long food chain and we start to replenish our grass, it's going to take a long time for something at the very top to recover. Uh, and so that's another idea. And the last one is just that um, a lot of times the carnivores that we're dealing with are very large and so they require a lot of biomass uh, to support themselves. And because of this uh, energetic hypothesis, um, if we have uh, too long of food chains, then these large carnivores aren't going to be able to support themselves. And they don't support themselves because we only have four to five in our uh, numbers that we look at. So now we're going to kind of switch gears 
and we're going to look at species that have a large impact on their community um, and their environment. And so we're going to be focusing on dominant species, keystone species, and foundation species. So the first one is dominant species. Dominant species are the most abundant or have the most biomass in their community. Um, and so some reasons why dominant species arise is because they have some sort of superior um, advantage or adaptation that allows them to use their resources better and then to populate the majority of their community. Um, another potential reason is invasive species. So if we have a species uh, come in from an outside uh, area, it a lot of times will have advantages over the other species in the community because it doesn't have any predators yet um, and, or it has some advantage uh, that it had developed elsewhere. And so then they'll start to uh, dominate the population, or sorry, not population, the community. And uh, so for all three of these, the way that we're able to see the impact that a dominant species has on its community is by removing it. So when you remove it, we're able to look at the changes that undergo in the community. And there's been some experiments where they've taken dominant species and they've removed them and they've seen the impact they had. Um, there's some examples of that in your book that you can read if you want uh, to see further. The keystone species uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the most abundant uh, in the community. Instead, it exerts a strong control on the community structure because of its uh, ecological nature or the role it plays in its community. Uh, and so uh, sometimes keynote species um, are influential because they help to maintain diversity. So an example of this is we had some uh, keystone species that ate uh, uh, that preyed on dominant species. And so if we removed that keystone species, then the dominant species was able to spread uh, further unchecked and it would take up habitats that used to be occupied by other species, and so now our species diversity is lowered. Um, another example is otters. Uh, these otters, certain sea otters, will feed on um, sea urchins, and the sea urchins feed on kelp, so it's kind of this trunk structure. And so as we uh, start to decrease the uh, otter population, because of some other predator that came in and is feeding on it, then we're going to allow an increase of the sea urchin to population, so now more sea urchins, and then it's going to cause a decrease in the uh, kelp population. Um, and so we just see how uh, important the otters is for maintaining the high level of kelp population. The last one is foundation species. Uh, so uh, these are species that uh, dramatically alter their environment, so that's how they impact the community. Um, so an example of this is beavers. They'll build the dams and that can cause pools of water to form or some sort of wetland and that can impact um, the other populations within the community. A lot of times these will act as facilitators. Um, so there's examples of plants that as they continue to develop and grow, they change the soil um, and that facilitates other plants and organisms being able to now reside uh, within that area. And so they kind of facilitate um, the addition of new uh, uh, populations, and so that helps to increase the diversity. The last thing we're going to touch on is bottom-up and top-down controls. So there's kind of three main uh, things that can happen of how um, changes in vegetation and herbivore numbers can affect each other. So the first one is we could have uh, an increase of vegetation uh, could lead to an increase of herbivores, but an increase of herbivores won't lead to an increase of vegetation. Um, or it won't affect the vegetation, the number of herbivores isn't going to affect our vegetation. Uh, this one, both would affect each other, so if we have an increase in vegetation, we have an increase in herbivores. If we had an increase uh, or decrease in herbivores, then we have a decrease in vegetation. And then the next one is uh, where if we have uh, something changes to the herbivore, then it's going to affect the vegetation um, population. So this one right here, we call it the bottom-up model. Um, so what happens is if we have an increase of nutrients, then it's going to increase our vegetation. And now there's more vegetation for herbivores to eat, so we can have more herbivores. And then more herbivores can lead to more predators. And so uh, we look at these and we say, if we add nutrients, uh, does it affect the predator population? And we say yes. If we add nutrients, then we end up having more uh, herbivores and predators. Um, whereas in these ones, if we remove predators, it's not going to have any impact um, on the lower levels. So we say um, bottom up, uh, changing the bottom uh, affects uh, moving up the tropic level. The reverse of this is the uh, top down model. Um, and this one is uh, really looking at predators. So if we remove or add predators, it's going to affect the lower levels of the tropic uh, structure. And so we use this a lot for biomanipulation. 
uh, which is a thing that scientists do uh, to impact different communities and environments. So how this works is it's kind of like what we did with otter population. If we uh, get rid of uh, some predator, then that will allow the herbivore that it used to feed on uh, to increase in numbers because it now doesn't have a predator. And as this increases in numbers, it's going to consume more vegetation, and so then our vegetation is going to decrease. So we're having the bottom, uh, from the top to uh, the bottom, we're impacting. And so an example of biomanipulation is there was uh, some cyanide bacteria that was residing in a lake because of some pollution. And so what scientists were able to do is um, they were able to remove predators uh, that um, fed on the organism that would um, decompose this cyan bacteria and as they uh, got rid of that predator now there was uh, a greater increase of the organism that would decompose that cyanide bacteria and then they're able to get rid of that cyanide bacteria without having to add any chemicals or things like that. Um, so that's all for today. I hope it was helpful. I hope you understand how the tropic structure in food webs better um, and the, the dominant species, keynote species, and kind of decent species. And then lastly, just the bottom up and top down controls. Uh, make sure you look at this stuff and be prepared to answer um, questions where they give you examples of situations and you have to identify what type of species it is um, or which is the primary or secondary or tertiary consumer. Uh, thank you so much for watching and have a fantastic day.